Um, I'm Jamila, and I've been with Camilla. Camilla, we've been working on the, and a lot of other amazing people, we've been working on the Climate Perspective seminars. Um, and for those of you who don't know, these seminars are happening for five weeks, and they're looking at climate change through a bunch of different perspectives. So there has been a lot, or there's, last week was on politics, this week is going to be through the perspective of development. Um, then there's also going to be economics, uh, individual action, and uh, law. So we want to give you a warm welcome tonight for this very exciting seminar with a, a pretty amazing speaker. Yeah. Um, I just want to briefly mention also last time was on Larry Lohman, and he talked about how climate change has always been, is very focused on like the Western discourse. Um, so even though the communities suffering the most are the poor communities of the global south, um, international politics are still very much focused on maintaining, um, yeah, maintaining Western discourse. But yeah. Great. So I am, my name is Camilla. I am the, uh, I have been leading the group convening these climate perspective seminars. Um, and I am uh, an undergraduate student here at SOAS as well. So um, the topic for tonight's seminar is climate change and development. And we will attempt to, and this, the objective of the seminar is to attempt to understand climate change from the perspective, as the name says, of development issues. We want to illustrate the importance of fully integrating climate issues in the development discourse. And we want to similar, similarly emphasize the significance of development issues for discussions on climate change. Um, the talk will be 45 minutes, and it will be followed by uh, a Q&A session um, in which you're also very welcome to open questions to the floor, if you like. Uh, we ask that you make your questions brief, um, and we will, the Q&A session will be about 25 minutes. We will try to end the seminar at around 10 to. Um, if you'd like to tweet about these seminars, the hashtag is Climate Perspectives. And now, it is my honor to present our speaker for this climate change and development seminar, Dr. Andrew Newsham. Andrew is a lecturer in international development, and he's a program convener for the dissertations program at the SOAS Center for Development, Environment, and Policy. Andrew has previously been a lecturer and convener at the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex University, and at the University of Oxford, Oxford, he's been a postdoctoral fellow in international development at the Climate Change Research School. He wrote his PhD in African Studies on local participation in conservation and development initiatives in Namibia and Argentina. As with last week's speaker, Andrew fits perfectly into the Climate Perspective Seminar Series, as his research uh, in the field of climate change and development revolves around a concern with power politics and inequality on a global and local scale. Andrew has conducted extensive research in Africa and South America, and he's currently conducting research in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Mexico. He currently focuses on three major research areas, these being the vulnerability of local communities to climate impacts, the role of ecosystems-based adaptations in protected areas, and on the political economy of climate-compatible development. And now I'm not going to say much more, um, I think it's quite obvious that we have uh, found the perfect speaker for tonight's seminar. So I'd like you to please give a warm welcome to Andrew Newsham. Thank you very much, both of you, for that very glowing recommendation, which I, um, I'm not quite sure I'll live up to, but I'll, I shall do my best. Um, and nice to see you all here. It's, uh, it's quite late now, but uh, it's, it's great to see you, to have a proper uh, number of people in the audience. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so, yeah, um, I, as Camilla has said, I'm, I'm quite interested in climate change and development, mainly from a you know, vulnerability and adaptation perspective. How do we respond, not we so much as poor people who have to show up to the burden of climate impacts, uh, respond to climate change, what do they do about that, what do they already know about that. Um, but today, uh, this evening, I guess we'll be taking a bit more of a, a macro uh, look at climate change and development and exploring the implications of um, a principle which is central to understanding um, climate change and, and how it repercusses for development, um, which is um, common but differentiated responsibilities, a principle um, well, I guess the principle hasn't changed over time, but the empirical circumstances to which we might apply the, the principle have changed quite substantially. And I, I think it's quite a timely 
moment to uh, to reflect on that and think about the implications. Now, I will warn you from the start, I have some conclusions which are a bit depressing and they're classically academic. I'm not telling you how to do anything about this, how to resolve it. Haven't really got there myself uh, in those terms, but at least if we can understand the problem, then maybe we can have a sensible conversation about what to do about it. So that's where I'll take you up to you tonight, and therefore the focus of the seminar will be a brief introduction on climate, climate change and development. I'm not going to take you through the climate science. I believe some of that has been covered already. And I'm sure you already knew that anyway, all you super smart people in the audience. So I, I am going to spend a little, a little bit of time on the so what, why would we worry about climate change, and uh, some of the impacts, um, and how to think about some of the impacts, and how, what level of worry we might want to have about them, and hopefully in a way which sort of starts to bring out some of the issues around inequity and social justice, which are at the heart of trying to understand the implications of uh, climate change for development, um, possibly vice versa as well. And then I'll move on to common but differentiated responsibility, what it is and how the, the, the facts around it, so to speak, have changed over time or the circumstances around it and the implications for development. So, um, the brief introduction to climate change and development, first of all. Um, let's take development on a very, very broad sort of scale of um, human activity um, in recorded history, if you like, with a view to establishing ever greater and larger um, collective organizations and processes um, around particular sort of material dynamics and, and states of affairs. Um, I think that's kind of a very broad brush, crude statement of what's been going on, um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of our history, of, of, in terms of the history of society anyway, uh, and how we've tried to organise ourselves. And a lot of how we've tried to organise ourselves is actually intimately linked to um, a period of time known as the Holocene, which you can see on this graph. Now, I don't want to set this up as some kind of sacred truth, if you like. Um, there are, th th it might be problematic to, de to describe um, the crisis that we, that we face in, the, in, in this term, in, in these terms, but let me just um, sp spell out how it, how it has been described and, and the, what we have to think about and the potential risks that, that, that we face. So if you look at this this graph. I don't want to go into all of the science behind it, not least because I'm not a climate or even a you know, uh, climate scientist, atmospheric physicist, or geologist. So there's only a certain extent I can speak to this diagram. But think about it in terms of um, the variability in climatic conditions um, over hundreds of thousands of years. And you start to understand quite how odd the Holocene is. We've had this period of relative sort of, if you like, climatic stability against the background of all of this natural variability, which is why critics of people who don't, you know, who critique the idea of human-caused climate change do have something of a point when they, when they point to the sheer magnitude of natural variability. But if you look at sort of, you know, some of the temperatures that, you know, that um, the, the Earth went down to, a lot of what we've come to take, take for granted, such as... Um, the great European civilizations. This is a this is a diagram from a, uh, an article by uh, Johann Rockström and others talking about um, planetary um, boundaries. Um, I should have put the reference on. Those aren't my words, but if you look at you know important events in the history of of, of collective human existence, the beginning of agriculture, the emergence of I mean you, I don't know how comfortable I am with the idea of a great European civilization, but of um, collective organization on that level, um, uh, sort of focused around particular modes of political activity, be they democratic, imperial, um, whatever, um, technologies uh, and institutions which, which allow for a greater level of, of coordination of humans and um, control over, over physical territory. Again, it, it happens in the Holocene. It's, if you like, it's a facilitator of some of the most important historical trajectories and processes which define our times today. Now, some people are starting to argue that we are moving into, or indeed have already moved into, something called 
the Holocene, sorry, the Anthropocene, this is um, another geological age whose key sort of um, signals and drivers in terms of global environmental change are caused by humans uh, and are characterized by humans more than by natural variability. This, again, is something that, you know, uh, we, we could debate and discuss. If you, if, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of these debates. I'm not sure how good I would be at following them in, in any detail, but I, I know that some stratigraphers, for example, and, and other types of geologists um, are concerned by the idea that, that it, we can measure in geological terms uh, the effect of humans upon, upon the planet and the makeup of the planet. But there's quite a lot of people who are arguing that, that we can. Uh, Rockstrom at, at Al, who wrote this article, uh, amongst them. And climate change is held by some people to be one of the planetary boundaries within which we need to stay if we are going to keep ourselves within the Holocene. Now, you could just say, actually, this is all just a, a political discourse which is focused around ensuring that some people maintain control over some political processes um, through having um, this big scary threat which justifies and legitimates particular forms of intervention by particular forms of actors. You could argue that. You'll find a whole literature on that. And uh, it, might be, it, um, <laughs> it might be that that is the case and that this is also the case. Um, so it's something to think about. Are we, are we actually going to propel ourselves into an, a new geological era characterized um, by environmental states that we as, as humans are going to struggle to live within? You know, are we going to beg the question of, of exactly under what conditions can we continue to cultivate, for example? Like, I guess at the, at the highest level, that's why at least it's, it's, a, it's something to, to think about even if you're skeptical about the kinds of science and the submerged politics um, which may, to a greater or lesser extent, um, underlie this, this kind of presentation of the evidence. Um, to bring that through to a sort of more tangible reading of, of what then are the projected climate uh, impacts and with um, reference to um, you know what we used to call developing regions, I, I think now we've uh, we've adopted some other problematic terms around high, low, and middle-income countries. Which uh, I won't go into the issues and problems of those there, but you'll feel free to ask me afterwards. But you can see that across a number of uh, key um, sort of areas in terms of food or a key um, you know key environmental. Uh, resources or key environments, if you don't want to call it a resource, there are potentially very large and increasingly scary impacts as the temperature goes up with global warming. At one degree C, I mean, this is some of the science on this is, is changing and we'll, we'll come to that. Generally speaking, things aren't as bad as they are if we get to six degrees global, global average. That is a global average. Six degrees C global average temperature rise probably means something like 20 degree uh, temperature rise in the poles where, where, where we have the ice caps. So that's, that's why there's this big concern about you know, things like sea level rise that, that may start to threaten uh, major cities. And giving ourselves more to do in terms of trying to maintain um, development trajectories, be that defined purely in terms of you know, maximizing economic growth and returns from, a, from, a, from economic activity, or be that defined in terms of reducing multidimensional poverty, achieving some state of well-being, however you, know, however you want to do that. At some point, there are going to be um, material effects which you're going to make it harder to, to, um, to maintain or to protect if, uh, if climate change does reach six degrees C. Um, by that point, we might well be out of the Anthropocene, but, but nobody actually knows, um, as far as I'm aware, anyway. So why climate change is or should be a fundamental concern for development should be relatively obvious. If you look at the distribution of climate impacts, uh, the ones that we're, we're most scared about around water, scarcity, 
demography, um, that's a bit more um, problematic, let's say, but there are demographic, there are demographic um, things happening in particular parts of the world which may not intersect in ways which are, which are very helpful, I guess, um, with, with other stuff that's happening, such as crop decline or, or hunger. Um, coastal risks, etc. So there's a there's a bunch of things which, in terms of their geographical distribution, mean that development practitioners have really started to think about the consequences of climate change for the kinds of places that they're working in, for the kinds of places in which they want to see some kind of good change. I guess that would be my definition of of development. I, I wouldn't. I'm not going to offer a definition of good in that context here. Um, I guess it would uh, it would have to be much more context specific and, and therefore not not universal. Um, and of course, it's to put it you know there's going to be lots and lots of graphs, um, and I don't want to sort of um, I guess it enlist sort of very emotive value laden images for, for for the sake of it. But it's 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 some people are going to be more affected than other people and these are the kinds of landscapes and circumstances to which it seems they will have a greater likelihood of of being subjected and of course this is one of the issues at the heart of the um the intersection between climate change and development is that the people who are least responsible contemporaneously or historically for the production of climate change are uh, most in the firing line, so to speak, in terms of where um, climate impacts are, are, are projected to, to occur uh, and, and indeed to, to make things that we do and things that we feel we need to do or that we do need to do, like eat uh, or get water, more difficult. Now, Whatever we do about climate change now, even if we decided globally, right, that's it, no more global em emissions, we're just gonna, we're gonna turn off climate change, uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, if that were possible, we would still be locked into some level of, uh, of future climate change, um, you know, in terms of temperature stabilization, might take a few centuries, sea level rise might carry on, um, similarly, for, for up to a thousand years, we don't know because it de all depends on what happens and how many emissions we, we we put into the atmosphere, what level of ocean acidification actually occur, um, and uh, how precise we can get in terms of our oceanography and, and our atmospheric physics about how many um, particles of uh, of this or that greenhouse gas lead to how many degrees of warming. There is still controversy and uncertainty over that. We have models and assumptions about it, but I, I think you know that there are, there are things still being learned about, about how that works, even though it comes from science which originates in, in the 19th century. But whatever we do do, we've put enough um, into the atmosphere as it is that it's gonna carry on going for, for quite a while, whatever our response to it is. And um, that's one of the things which has been sharpening, if you like, debate around what level of uh, warming should we try to contain ourselves within, if we can. And for much of the, you know, the early part of the 21st century, the, the agreed sort of number, if you like, was two degrees C. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Stern report, which came out, uh, you know, gosh, 11 years ago now. Um, that was the figure that the Stern, the Stern report was, was trying to, to keep to, and it was something which, you know, over time became a politically acceptable number in terms of if what we're gonna have to do, um, you know, in terms of the costs of, of uh, adapting to climate change and, and the costs of mitigating so that we can hopefully take, um, we've not put so much uh, in the way of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere in the first place. Um, you know, that was the number that, that, that gained traction. But the science on this, as you may know, has, has also been shifting. You've, you've probably, I don't know if you've ever been to a sort of a climate um, uh, march or rally or demonstration or something, but you'll see people, and you, from 2008, you will have seen people with like, let's, let's reduce it to 1.5 degrees, let's, let's, let's keep it at one degree 
as a target rather than two degrees. And that's because, as I say, what, what is seen to be dangerous climate change is not um, is, 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 is felt now, is projected to happen at lower temperatures. So previously, to take the, the, exist, the example of risks to unique and threatened systems, you probably can't see the writing at the bottom there, it's so tiny. Um, you might, um, in 2001, have thought that the risk starts to come in, you know, with any sort of level of seriousness uh, around the sort of the, the two degree level. But if you look over on the right hand side of this, the same bar on the, on the first, the first bar on the left here. If you look at that bar, the, the red comes down much further and the pattern is repeated across uh, a number of other phenomena. So risk of extreme uh, weather events, distribution of impacts, aggregate impacts, risk of large scale discontinuities. That's the sort of, we leave the Holocene type event um, becomes likelier at uh, sort of lower temperatures, although you know they're still higher for what we see as risks of large scale, large scale discontinuities. So it kind of seems like less warming is going to cause more damage. I suppose that's the the, the basic message, and that's why it's such a concern that we already have put so much into the atmosphere and that there is this inertia effect that um, is, is, uh, is held then to, to, to obtain for, for anything up to uh, over a thousand years. So how close to the wind are we sailing? I guess that's the, the basic question that's, that's being begged here. And um, I mean, this reference is from 2011. There's been more, you know, this kind of study will be done on a... On a um, a yearly basis, really, and often by the same people. Um, this is Anderson and Bowes. They're, they're both at, um, Kevin Anderson and Alice Bowes. They're at the University of Manchester, part of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research, which is what I was part of when I was at Oxford. Um, and they wrote, uh, and they're still talking about this, about the likelihood of keeping global warming below a two degree C threshold. And they think they thought back then it was vanishingly small. And that's because with what we've already put into the, um, the atmosphere, we have less that we can then put if if we want to keep the 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 uh, the overall emissions envelope um, within a safe level of or a, you know a, a relatively less dangerous uh, level of warming. So and you, and you make the task more difficult for yourself because the more you put in there, and uh, then then the shorter the time you have to do something about it, and the 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 bigger the emissions reductions every year have to be. And back in 2000 and, uh, well, 10 when they were doing the calculations for this, it was published in 2011, um, they were thinking that we would have to see emissions reduction rates of around 7 to 8% per year just in order to um, keep to a target of, um, I think it was 80% reduction in, in emissions by 2050. And of course, we're not doing anything like that. And if you look historically, at least in recent history, of what would you need to do to get that level of carbon uh, or greenhouse gas emissions reductions happening, um, you're basically looking at global recession. So if you look at what happened in 2008 um, with the financial crisis, there was a dip, I think it was in, in, in the order of 5% reduction in, in carbon emissions. So we kind of did ourselves a favor there. Um, even as we cast, uh, you know, lots of people into uh, into in, into poverty, um, you know, and and hopefully there are other ways of reducing emissions by that much. But that's the only thing we've got any historical evidence that that actually has done that. So um, yeah, um, sort of reasons for optimism, obviously. So there's there's no real analog in human history to tell us then, you know, if we didn't hit that. You know what would we what would be what would it be like say to go up to four degrees C? We don't we don't really know. There's no we can't there's no recorded history which will tell us that. Um, but there is history of the of the mini ice age that we had a few hundred years ago, um, when the average temperature was four to five degrees C lower than uh, than it is is now. And as I say, that was like you know 
<laughs> an ice age, which, which is a, a much harder climate in which to, to grow stuff and, and, and to live, of course. And it's, of course, it wouldn't be colder, it would be warmer. And it's, it doesn't give you a sense of how that would be, but it gives you a sense of the order of magnitude of the change. So, um, you know, 1.5 degrees C would be hopefully quite nice if we could keep to it, which it seems that we can't. So that's the broad, if you like, um, kind of implications of climate change for development as defined very broadly as, uh, as I did um, throughout that discussion. I want to move on now to common but differentiated uh, responsibility, what it is and how it has changed um, over time. So it's a principle basically that was established um, as part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, uh, which you may have come across at some point. And that's one of the international environmental conventions that emerged from the 1992 Rio Earth Summit right in the, the sort of halcyon days of sustainable development. We're going to do it. Everyone's kind of enthused about it, uh, you know, uh, and there was an energy around it, which, which, is, uh, is, which is difficult to find today, sadly. But maybe we can reactivate it somehow, and maybe there's more stuff going on under the surface than we realize. But um, the idea is that Everybody bears some responsibility for climate change, but some substantially more than um, others because of primarily in differences in, in the historical responsibility for climate emissions. Because of this point I mentioned before about the distribution of exposure and vulnerability to climate impacts. And because of differences in the resources that some countries have available to fund adaptation and mitigation relative to other countries. So, you can't expect someone who hasn't really caused the problem <coughs> to take the lead on solving it, is I guess the basic idea. And this was enshrined in what the, um, the early sort of, uh, in the early years, the, the UNFCCC, the, you know, the international UN climate negotiations were trying to achieve, which was to get everyone to sign up to the Kyoto Protocol. Do you all know what the Kyoto Protocol is? Or was, rather? Yeah, okay. So, um, did you know that some countries had to reduce their emissions and some countries were kind of off the hook? So that's because of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, because um, countries like the UK, like the US, um, you know, the science was already pretty clear that we, we had emitted loads of, uh, of, of, of carbon and other greenhouse gases, and so we should be signing up to, to, um, to a target, an internationally legally binding target to, to reduce them, which of course the UK did and the United States famously didn't. Um, but loads of other countries like China, India, um, lots of countries which could not have been said in any way at that point to have had uh, responsibility historically for the, for the sorts of climate emissions that were meaning that humans were causing climate to change more than natural variability was. Um, they didn't have to do anything about it, so uh, for, for obvious reasons. But there's a, a departure from this kind of classic position at the Paris climate negotiations in 2015. You, you may have come across these. Um, it's still under the, you know, the UNFCCC process, and it was the one where there was, um, well, depending on your perspective, a breakthrough, a cover-up, a distraction. Um, but there was something different that happened there. Um, because there was agreement not just by um, wealthy, uh, rich countries whose historical responsibility for putting carbon into the atmosphere had been well established, but also um, the, the, um, all of the, you know, what, what formerly we referred to as the Annex II countries were, um, have been signing up, have indeed signed up to this. It's on a voluntary basis. There is no legally binding target here. But, um, but um, loads of countries, and especially the ones with the, with the highest level of, uh, of, of emissions, have been coming up with their plans for how much they are going to reduce in terms of carbon emissions and within what time frame, even though there are arguments over the baseline, and should it be 1990 or should it be 2005, which is the one that suits countries um, like China or India or Indonesia or Mexico um, better. 
So um, why is it that that would happen? Why, why is it it, it, it it implies that some countries have become more responsible for climate change over time? And this is what I want to talk about a little bit now. Just and by way of doing this, I want to just show you a map of the world pretty much as it looks, um, I guess, uh, in, in terms of the, the size of, of, of land masses. And I just, uh, using the carbon map here, I think you've been to this website, but it's really cool. It animates all of this. But I've tried to do this before in lectures, and I've never actually been in a lecture theatre anywhere where the internet actually works. So I've just done some screen grabs. Um, but go and go to the actual um, <laughs> website itself. Um, because it shows you all of this uh, in, in, in animated ways. It's, it's not just, it's, it's cool in a very saddening and depressing kind of a way. But this, this shows you sort of, in, in terms of the distribution of, of land masses, this is what countries tend to look like, so we think, and the, um, the, the levels of wealth within those countries, and you won't be surprised that the lighter colors are poorer countries and the darkest colors are the richest countries. So, um, the thing that this map does is it changes the size of the country according to their the the, the propensity of uh, of that country to contribute or not to to any particular of the phenomena that that this software maps so look what happens when you look at historical uh, emissions and current emissions um, per capita so the colors change the colors change to indicate per person how many tons of co2 are emitted each year and we can see you know there's no surprise really here in in in, in the culprits the uk looms pretty large the united states looms even larger that's what we'd all expect um some parts of the african continent you you, you just they they disappear you just I, I you know where is sierra leone where is liberia where is where is the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the biggest, you know, <laughs> countries in the world? So, um, I, I guess it's a sort of, you know, a, a, a visual tool to, to, to get us to think about uh, about this. And it, it, it follows very much this sort of narrative of, well, we have responsibility in the West or the global North, whichever you prefer, um, to, to deal with this because, look, historically, that we've caused the problem. However... Um, if you look at um, CO2 emissions, both in per country terms and per capita, I'll, I'll get to this, um, it's harder to, dis to uh, disentangle the responsibility because China um, overtook the US in 2008, was it, or 2009, as the, the world's biggest emitter of, uh, of carbon. And this is a, a fact which uh, um, people in the... <laughs> You, 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 the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency have uh, have um, <laughs> have propagated in, in in many different fora, not not just them, but but lots of people. There is a sort of change, if you like, in the calculation around responsibility. If China is emitting the same as uh, the United is, is emitting, sorry, more substantially more than the United States, then. Who becomes responsible for dealing with climate change? And um, where does that common but differentiated responsibility lie? Do we now give more responsibility to China, even if we don't give less responsibility to the United States, uh, although the United States, as we know, is now even less interested in the climate negotiations <laughs> under Donald Trump than it was? I challenge you to go and find anything on the... Uh, the uh, White House website these days about climate change. It's all been taken down, as will the Environmental Protection Agency be by Scott Pruitt, it would seem. So if you look at the incidence of poverty per capita, it's, I probably should have chose different, chosen different colors, but you see that um, the, the lighter colors are the ones where there aren't very much there aren't very many emissions and the darker ones are where there are quite a lot so the US for example shrinks into a very bizarre kind of um, shape um, you know but is is deep red at the same time <laughs> um, whereas the African continent you know some of it on, on my screen is actually invisible it's that it's that sort of 
um, light in color. So, um, but, but it looms so large on the map because of the incidence of poverty. And again, it says something um, uh, around the fact that poor people um, tend not to contribute very much to climate uh, impacts, but of course they're very much exposed to the distribution of those impacts. 15 minutes, okay, I'm, I'm good for time. I think I'm gonna finish before 20 past eight. And then if you look at the incidence of people at risk, um, you see that mass, I mean, there's, you know, the African continent still looms quite large, but actually it's in Asia where a huge amount of the, the risk is these so-called kind of, you know, climate hotspots uh, in places like the Mekong River Delta, where there's gonna be huge amounts of flooding, from glacial, melting and, and other other sort of things coming together to, to make people um, more exposed and quite often more vulnerable to climate impacts although we shouldn't conflate exposure to an impact and you know assuming that that makes you vulnerable lots of people have spent their whole lives dealing with climate variability and know how to do that much better than we do in this auditorium um, <clears throat> but the the red in this case if it doesn't look quite so red there but and the red in this case actually um, indicates um, not the, the CO2 per capita, but the, um, the emissions change. So how much these countries have started to, um, to emit um, since 1990. And in the case of China and India, for example, uh, and some African countries as well, some parts of Latin America, it's it's up somewhere between 100,000% or it's up over 1,000%. So again, we can see that there's a real um, overlap here between the people who are most at risk in some ways or at least the most exposed to climate impacts and, um, and where emissions are, are going up. So, um, again, it raises questions about who then becomes responsible for dealing with climate change and what form that response should take on. Now, this is showing some of the same information in a different way, and I want to single out China because it frequently is singled out China, and to beg this question of, you know, is China really the culprit here if you, if you look at sort of the global emissions that... China is, is implicated in. And on this graph, you would, well, you might say, well, yes, it is. Because if you look from 1990, the, the, the line that goes up really radically is, is China's line. Um, the, uh, the, the other line near the top there is the US. They have a bit of a dip again. It's because of recession rather than because they're being really good with their emissions reductions. Similar thing happens for Europe. It's starting to go down, and mainly because of recession, but also <clears throat> for other reasons. The line at the bottom here is, is Brazil. They, those guys are not changing too much. But it's China that really stands out. It's that sort of progression. India, to a much lesser extent, India is the sort of reddish line that's going up towards the end there, but not nearly to the same extent as, as, as China is. So it's the kind of um, graph that you might use to say, we need to hold China more responsible for what it's doing because you know, before maybe they weren't responsible, but now they're really driving climate change. And this is where the policy focus should be in terms of stopping them from doing that. But um, to get back to that shading we were seeing before and the, the emissions per person, per capita, that we saw on the map before, the line at the top is not China, that's the United States. And then um, the yellow line is the European Union and the line that is going up towards the end there that's China. And at the bottom there, um, that's all of the least developed countries according to the UN um, classification. So those guys, as we can see, are really not part of uh, the problem. So, um, but Chinese people arguably are not either because they're still, their, their average emissions are below our own 10 minutes. Cool, thank you. So on this reading, you would say, you would have to say that actually, we still got to point back towards countries like the United States where, you know, they're using 20 
tons of, of carbon emissions per, per year just, just to live their lives in, in the way that they live. Massively sort of resource intensive um, way of living. So, depending on how you present the data, you have to then think about the consequences for how differentiated are our responsibilities. A constant in all of this is that poor people are not very responsible. I think that's the uncontroversial thing, whichever graph you use. Um, but then, you know, the, these kinds of graphs are, um, beg this question then of, of, you know, back to, is it about, um, is it really fair to blame China for having the largest emissions just because it's got a population of 1.3 billion people as opposed to, is it 370 million for the states, is that? 350. Yeah. Who, who have a much higher carbon footprint. Okay. So, <clears throat> that's another, I guess, sort of thing that needs to filter through to our thinking and has been filtering through, through to our thinking around um, common but different, different uh, differentiated responsibilities. Um, but there's another set of considerations which if you look at a country like China, um, start to come into play. So, um, if you look at the sub-national um, dimensions in China and start to ask there, okay, what responsibility is borne and by whom? And it also becomes quite tricky. And this is in the context of China. I mean, we can talk about it as the world's largest emitter. It's also the world's large, largest producer of renewable energy technologies, as I'm sure that you all know. Um, and it's got some, um, you know, it's got some pretty serious commitments to reducing carbon intensity, um, even if those are not necessarily measured to the standards that some environmentalists would like. It's a big step in the right direction, just like Donald Trump is a great step in the right direction if you are on the alt-right. So, um, not that that's an endorsement in any way. So, um, the difficulty of really either of the two ways in which we've been thinking about um, common but differentiated responsibilities and how this has changed over time, whether you take this graph or whether you take this graph, is that other countries, if you like, outsource their carbon emissions to China. So 57% of China's emissions are derived from goods consumed outside the province of, of origin. Um, and when we calculate our carbon emissions in the UK, uh, when other countries do it, we don't take into account all that stuff, that all the emissions from all that stuff that we have bought, but which is actually made in China. Um, another concern here is that consumption levels are growing in China, and if they did reach the US levels, um, I mean, I'm not the best person to speak to, I guess, cultures of ma material prosperity in, 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 in China, but I, I get this, the sense from the little that I've read on the subject that, that that is a definite increasing phenomenon, as it is in so many parts of the world. It's not you know, exclusive to China, of course. Um, but if they reach, say, US levels, then the efficiency improvements you could get even from installing renewable energy um, would, according to some studies, be insufficient to offset the increases in carbon emissions. And then there's the question of how is responsibility for carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions calculated within China? And one of the plans that are linked to, that is linked to China's broader effort, uh, you know, for example, through its uh, bilateral deal with the United States, through its commitments to the, the, uh, the Paris um, climate settlement deal, um, is, is to reduce its carbon intensity, intensity through giving each province uh, a target and, and it has to reduce its own carbon intensity. The thing about this is that 80% of the emissions from goods consumed in the richer coastal provinces, which used to be industrial, but which shipped it off to the poorer central and western provinces because it's pretty dirty, environmentally contaminating, not very good for human health kind of stuff, um, is imported from the poorer um, and central and western provinces. And so if you look at a, a carbon intensity production target being set for those provinces, not only are they already experiencing the worst of the uh, environmental problems from that level of industrial production and that kind of pretty dirty 
um, industrial production. Um, they also, <laughs> in this regime, bear the greatest responsibility for, uh, for emissions reduction. Whereas richer provinces which consume the goods made in these poorer provinces will more easily meet these targets. So this dynamic of the teleconnectivity, if you like, of um, responsibility is manifest both, both globally and you know, sub-nationally just within China. This is without looking at any other country, but of course China is a very interesting um, case study because whatever happens in China is going to make such a difference to, to the rest of us. So, um, to conclude, um, common but differentiated responsibility remains a fundamentally relevant principle um, in terms of working out who should make decisions about what in relation to dealing with climate change. Um, there is still a very strong correlation between bearing the cost of climate change and other environmental problems and not being responsible for carbon emissions. And that's the area it, you know, in which, I guess, climate change continues to touch most upon what it is we should be thinking about and doing in relation to development activity. Be that defined narrowly in terms of aid land or the kind of you know, national development trajectory that, that governments like the Chinese government are pursuing so, so actively. Um, current global trajectories of development at the moment, especially those rooted in serving uh, global consumption as a conduit to economic growth, and we haven't quite financialized the whole of the global economy just yet, continue to perpetuate a dynamic in which the poorest tend to um, suffer most in one way, shape or form. And then the changes in which uh, countries are the biggest emitters uh, arguably reproduce rather than resolve the questions of social justice at the heart of thinking on common but differentiated uh, responsibility as we saw, for example, in, in the provincial breakdown in China. So I shall uh, leave it there for now, but that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. emerging as a result, which climate change is just one of them. So you needed to, I think, in your lecture, the question is, what is development? How is it connected with the problems that you've outlined? Yes? And to bring out the causal story more, because the causal story seems to be lacking. Yes, so we have a question on global development strategy. Um, as individuals, we often we want to know. I think everyone in here is very keen on, on taking some kind of action on climate change in general. So, but if you think of climate change and development, um, if you think of the topic of climate change and development, how can we as individuals take action on that specifically? 
on the link between what, sorry? So, in, we often ask, like, how can we take action on climate change mm -hmm. as a whole? But so take, like, the discussion between, or the term common but differentiated responsibility or the terms mitigation and adaptation. In, say, when we go to marches or when we write articles about it or when, sh which terms should we be using? How should we be thinking about it? What, in your objective, is the most effective way for us to address the link between climate change and development? Okay, thank you for three very good questions. The first one, um, I guess, broadly, what is my definition of um, development um, and what kind of, um, you know, policies, sound policies would we need to confront the, the current trajectory and, and the, the problems that we're having with it and the contradictions that are emerging, the, the causal story, um, which I haven't said very much about um, in terms of how development is causing climate change, I think was your, was your point. I don't agree with the idea that we can talk about development and have these kinds of contradictions emerging at the same time. There's a contradiction between development and the problems that are emerging. I, I, you'd have to say a little bit more about that before I could understand your... What I mean is this. I mean, China is supposed to No, it's it's the lead emitter of, of global okay. of carbon yeah, emissions. It's not responsible for the majority of carbon emissions. No. Yes. Okay. Now it seems to me there's a contradiction about talking about development taking place in China in those kind of conditions. Okay. You can't think. It's like <laughs> my health is getting better, but I'm getting sick. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. The two don't go together. Sure. You know yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarification. The next question was about how we should be talking about and thinking about the link between climate change and development in, in terms of our own individual, what we might choose to do, I guess. Is that right? And the third one is about can we have sustainable economic development in the future? Um, I think your, your concern is, is uh, to deal with the, the first question first. I mean, the, the way that I understood it is you're, you're kind of talking almost in the terms that, you know, Marx might have described what you're talking about as the metabolic rift, which is the, the way in which um, capitalism environmentally um, creates the conditions of its own destruction because of the way in which it draws upon the environment. Um, Marx was talking about this in terms of the shift of, of, of nutrients which were necessary for local agriculture, which previously would have been fed back into the, into the ground, but which didn't make it there because they went to the city. But you can extrapolate from that sort of logic up to uh, the ways in which we shift uh, nutrients and, and other um, um, environmental um, properties and services around the world these days because of the globalized character of, of, of the economy. Is that a contradiction? Can we, re can we rely on that model to solve the problems of climate change? Well, that, of course, is the question of the 21st century, yes. Um, so, um, I, and you're right, I didn't dwell very much on the extent to which development, if, if you understand it uh, as efforts towards maximizing global economic activity. No. Okay, Do you, would you like to clarify? Are you saying the development you'd like to see or the development that we Not have? What I want to see. If the world is moving towards extinction, hmm. then we can't call that development. Can we? Okay, so... Can we? I, I don't think it's um, a very wise um, course of action. I think you can call it development because we, we do call it development. There are governments who pursue a strategy of maximizing um, 
you know, their, their, their own country's uh, GDP as a form of, you know, basic underpinning of most of the policies that they use. Whether we would want them to do that is another question, but I think that there is a, a sense in which that, that exists, however contradictory it, it, it may be. So... Well, don't call it development. That's what I'm saying. Don't call it development because it's destructive. Okay, so we could call it neoliberal capitalism. How, how about that? Would that... It's destructive. You see, this is the problem. The language, the language of the so-called development theories like you is destroying, is contradictory in the sense that what we see from this pack, this development in inverted court, in, in inverted commas is destruction. Um. <laughs> Well, it's very kind of you to acknowledge me as a development theorist. I don't know if, I, if I've quite uh, reached the, the, those uh, echelons. But um, um, I, in terms of, is, is it, can you call something development which will destroy itself or parts of the planet? Maybe I'm just, it seems, sorry, there's something it seems that I'm not getting in what you're saying because every time I say it, you sort of shake your head. But let me just, yeah, I think. As a global system right now it is, and, and it, therefore arguably, and this is the question, it's, it speaks to your question as well, can, can we reform um, what, what now seems to be quite a destructive model in terms of its own, uh, in terms of its own internal logic to, to, be, to be less so? That's the question that I posed at the start of the, uh, the lecture on, uh, are we going to go out of the Anthropocene? In terms of, you know, are we going to you know, destroy the world. I don't think we are. It's, it's more that we're going to move into a kind of social ecological state that we might struggle to exist in. That's the thesis of the Anthropocene in its most sort of like environmental prophecy of, of, of doom kind of uh, uh, guise, if you like, is, is that we, the Earth will survive. We're not going to, you know, blow it up or something and say that there's nothing left of it. It's just that we are going to um, make our own survival uh, a lot more difficult um, if some of our projections about um, exceeding planetary boundaries um, are, have explanatory purchase and predictive power in the future. Would you call that, therefore, a development trajectory? Yeah, I would. I mean, it's not a development trajectory which is, um, is very edifying or very, uh, is one that I would particularly espouse. Um, but, uh, you know, at some level, you have to acknowledge how language is actually used uh, and the, the, the meanings that people give to it. And whether or not you agree with that, um, the, 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 then... My problem, then... my problem is it's negative. You see, I always used to like yeah. that development was a positive thing. You know? Sure. Okay. In the sense of something that's positive. Yeah. That's right. my problem. Well, we have some more questions on this later, so maybe we can yeah. go on to them. Okay. Don't have to, my question was more just to, to have you talk a bit about it, but I think it's also very much linked to, to yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. You can keep on. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I think in theory, you probably could. Um, decarbonize capitalism, if you like, um, if I can put it that way. Um, it, it may not be still a very, um, it may not happen, um, but if it does happen, it may not bring us the kind of development that we would like or something, you know, something we would like to call development. Because if you think about some of the trade-offs that um, a green economy will entail, take the example of South Africa, um, if you think about the importance of the, uh, the unions in um, providing um, support to the apartheid uh, resistance to the, AN to, the, to the very existence of the ANC um, and you know, the, 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 their importance of the establishment of, of democracy in South Africa, it's huge. But we're talking about coal mining, for example, right? What happens to those coal miners under a green economy in South Africa, just because it's environmentally less problematic, you have to ask the same questions of who wins, who loses, what are the implications for, for equity and justice. We saw in China that they have a, you know, um, uh, 
I, I think you, you, know, you can take the Chinese government at its word when it says that it really is going to try to reduce carbon emissions. I don't think they're just like saying that and they're not going to do anything about it. Um, but but the, the same questions about equity and justice and who really loses from this and who, who benefits emerge whether you have a sort of green capitalism, if you like, or if you have a brown one. So um, I think in theory, yes, it can happen, although it's by no means sort of automatically going to happen. But if you look at things like the fact that there are now projections that the cost of solar energy will be cheaper than the cost of coal within 10 years, you can see the kind of the way in which that's, that changes the incentive structure for energy provision and for investment in energy in the future. You know, there are things like that where actually, you know, we could get an awful lot greener, but, it, you know, just because it's green, you know, um, doesn't mean that it's automatically um, a vehicle for social justice. And very briefly, um, okay, so... Um, how should we be thinking about the link between climate change and development? Um, well, as individuals, uh, as individuals yeah. Um, it, and you, do you mean in terms of what we then would? I think also it's also very much in terms of the language. I think here at SOAS we're quite aware that climate change is inherently linked to uh, I mean inequalities. Um, mm. They were these UN terms that, that don't actually help the people who will be most affected by climate change, the people mm. um, in the countries that I know you've done, you've done loads of research in Florida, if, you, <laughs> if you know this. Um, but but mm. so the people that are most sure. burdened by climate change, how we can, as individuals, perhaps here in the West, how we can, and as the gener in our generation also, how we can put more focus on this and take action on the link Climate change and inequality and climate change and development. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess um, maybe there's a sort of process of contestation there, which you could see in a variety of, 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 of ways in terms of contesting what, what we mean by adaptation and mitigation. For myself, I wouldn't necessarily completely abandon them, um, but of course, they, they, they can be used in ways which reinscribes a politics of indifference towards the fundamental uh, root causes of inequality uh, and of which um, exposure to and vulnerability to, to, to environmental impacts is, is often a pretty pretty good, if not, per, albeit imperfect sort of you know, measure. So there is something there about interrogating the use of these terms even just, I guess when we're talking about climate change and, and learning about this sort of stuff, I guess. I mean, you could see it in this kind of Gramscian way of um, doing that in the context of trying to, um, I don't know, facilitate some kind of passive revolution in which as members of an elite where we, we are part of the kind of hegemony, if you like, as, as Gramsci would see it, um, we're not necessarily contesting, we're not necessarily contesting development and having some kind of, something of it where it cannot be negative if you like, however you want, however you would understand that word. Uh, but w we are actually, maybe through the use of the term or whatever, even if we're critiquing it, also uh, contesting it. And, and Gramsci's idea of a, a sort of passive revolution, if you like, would, um, would, would mean subtly influencing the definitions of development, if you like, in the conversations of the people to which we have access. And, you know, we are sort of closer to the elite, I guess, than... Um, uh, than a lot of people who say have have cleaning jobs, cleaning universities, you know, um, then maybe that's another way to, to to think about doing it in a sort of softly, softly way. But you might need to need a bit more grammar before you do that. As might I. <laughs> uh, more questions? Yeah. Okay, that was one.
South African Union and their kind of support for the Lisbon Accord. Because uh, I was thinking when you mentioned that, I was thinking immediately of the East Indies. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, yeah, okay, so. Sure. Um, okay, so first question was about how much climate finance actually reaches local people for adaptation and mitigation purposes. Um, I don't think it's very much because if you look at sort of what is what what, what is pledged to deal with climate, uh, you know, what, what what first of all, if you take say um, for dealing with climate in in sub-Saharan Africa, I think it's something like the the recent calculation is that 18 billion US dollars is required um, for, for, which sounds actually not very much. You know, there's probably estimates that go up to it above 100 billion dollars. Um, and if you look at what's actually been pledged, it's about a billion, and what's actually been spent, it's about 379 million US dollars. So there's, so you can see the very, you know, sort of, um, 
you might even call it sort of calamitous attrition of a, of a commitment there um, in terms of how it actually works out. I, I would kind of, you know, in relation to some of the comments we've said, I mean, you, you don't get much um, in terms of, you do get some stuff in terms of mitigation, but a lot of developing countries are uh, a bit annoyed by the idea that they should be doing mitigation precisely because of, you know, the existence of Annex Zero countries or, um, um, you know, the, the, the idea that they haven't got the same historical responsibilities. So I think a lot of them are more focused on, on adaptation if there is funding for that, but um, not very much. You might get funding which addresses um, adaptation objectives, funding like if you look at social protection, sometimes it helps people to deal with climate impacts by not having to have do distress sales of, of, of you know, things like their cattle, which are effectively their savings. So you can get things like that, which are not always measured as an effect and have a you know, help, but, but in terms of the actual climate finance, it's <laughs> not that much. So um, the, to clarify about the unions, yes, it was the South African unions that I was talking about. Um, Sustainable development as a, uh, gosh, I can't read my own writing. Yes, you know, it's a bit like the question we were having before. I mean, it should be possible technologically. It's, it's, it's totally possible technologically for us to, to meet the kinds of climate targets that we have, that have been specified by scientists, environmentalists, governments, etc. Um, Scotland has, just to, to say why that's sometimes not happening, Scotland has something like a quarter of all the potential across Europe for wind power generation. The UK could run completely off wind power if, if, we, if we so chose to. Uh, and, and we're not choosing to, which comes to the question about, about the politics and right-wing politics and does this, this, uh, does this make it harder for, for, for us to, to make some of these changes? Because if you think of people like Trump and not just Trump, I mean, there were Democrats who supported the appointment of Scott Pruitt as the guy who is the, now the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, who has made it his stated aim for many years that he, he wants to he wants to um, destroy it or at least severely limit its 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 regulatory um, sort of extent and capacity. So, uh, and we don't have a Scott Pruitt in. Um, well, we we do have climate skeptics in 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 both the development department and and in the energy department, energy and climate change departments, but. It's not nearly to the same extent, and of course we have laws around climate targets. So, you know, unless the law gets changed, there's, there's a certain amount that we, we have to do. But since the change of the, you know, when, when, we, when we had a Labour government, we were doing quite a lot of this. And, and, you know, if you look at, you know, when is climate change ever even discussed these days? It's almost like the elephant in the room, you know, because it's not an issue which has much public, you know, uh, salience anymore, I guess, or as much as it did anyway. So, um, the Anthropocene critique, yeah, this is the hardest question. I, 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 my honest answer is I don't really know uh, in terms of your decolonizing um, sort of uh, the way in which we think about climate justice. I think that's a really interesting question. It's not something I, I don't really work on that specifically. Um, I don't know how far we've we've got um, with that, but I certainly haven't read very much about it. I'd be interested to you know, hear from you some of your ideas. You sound like you've done much more thinking about it than, than I have, so that's a bit of a cop-out, I'm afraid. I mean, on, on the Anthropocene, the critique you mentioned is the one that I've seen the most as well, which is the, you know, this, this whole thing about we, don't, we, we then don't differentiate the responsibilities when we talk about humankind in, in the round, as opposed to focusing for example, on the, the 90 private and state entities which arguably are responsible for 90% of carbon emissions um, uh, in, in the last 150 years, I think it is. I can't quite remember the, the statistics right now, but I can send you the article if you're interested. Um, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really good question about decolonizing um, the, the climate discourse and how would we how would we do that? I mean, it's hard enough to decolonize, you know, traditions such as political philosophy, where you may be able, you know, it's hard to it's hard to do because there are, you know, in, if you think about, I mean, I'm thinking about say, um, 
in African countries, often you have a difficulty that, you know, history is not necessarily recorded. People pass down traditions orally or whatever, and some of it survives, some of it doesn't. So it's, you know, going back that far, even things like political philosophy, it's quite hard to to then do that. But if we, if we, if we, yeah, I, 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 let me put that as something I need to do some more thinking about anyway, and I'm happy to talk about that further. Um, but yeah, it seems quite hard to do in terms of looking at who's writing about climate change right now. But that's a really important question to ask. And, you know, the only concrete thing I could think of is um, some of the initiatives around the fifth assessment report uh, for the IPCC. There were some minimal efforts to get people who had local or traditional knowledge about climate to be represented in the authorship of it, although they were very minimal and there were, there were calls for that to happen more. That's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. Um, gosh, I can't read my own writing. Um, rise of the right, yes. Did, did I cover your question before, uh, do you think? Sure. I mean, it's tough, isn't it? Because environmental issues are one of those ones which look like sort of the, uh, you know, the domain of the liberal elite, and the liberal uh, elite is, is, uh, is you know, um, has has lost a lot of a lot of ground, if you like. So, it's not in many ways a, a hopeful time for some environmentalists. But then, if you also if you look at the roots of um, environmental politics and the way and the I mean I don't know you know talking about I, I wouldn't know what to say about a country like China it'd be really interesting to know how you know I, I don't see that China would necessarily change its climate policies because um, the United States is now that it has this trajectory towards renewable energy for example um, but of course they may not feel like you know reducing their carbon intensity by by quite that much of course it could have potentially really scary ramifications I don't think that the Paris Agreement was just hot air. Who's, that was your question, wasn't it? I don't think it was just hot air. Um, it, it's just that, you know, in order to get the level of agreement that they wanted, they had to remove the bit about it being legally binding. And they had to remove the bit about southern countries being able to sue northern countries for historical uh, injustices. Um, so... <laughs> You could argue that it's a very toothless agreement because of you know having just glossed over those two you know issues which arguably are fundamental to the questions of social justice, which climate change is one way into, if you like. Um, but I, I think that there was um, it was very hard to bring about even that level of agreement, and it, it was in some ways unlikely. And um, let's see. But at the moment, I think that there are quite a lot of commitments. We'll have to see if they're still kept which will take us to three degrees C of warming. Um, that's what is currently, so there's a gap there, about a 1.5 degrees C gap, if you can take any of these numbers seriously, which I'm, uh, <laughs> I think we're still working out. Um, but I, I personally think that, that, I don't think we should just overlook it as complete, like, you know, I think it, it was hard one, let me put it that way.